The Roman Empire is the most well-known period of our ancient history. We are told that, once upon a time, there were Stone Age cavemen. Then came the Sumerians in what is today known as Iraq, then the Egyptians with their pyramids, then the Greeks, then the Romans, then the Middle Ages, finally, the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago. And here we are today. Civilization, they tell us, happened in the last couple thousands of years. You've learned about it in school, saw it in movies and documentaries. Ancient Rome has a huge influence on us, because many of the things we rely on today, like roads, hospitals, plumbing, and even things like sofas, mail services, and defense systems, can all be traced back to what the Roman Empire created. Put Roman Empire into Google, and you get 288 million results. Surely with that much information on it, it must have existed. On the page of movies about ancient Rome, I counted 182 productions, mostly Hollywood films. Surely they wouldn't make that many movies about something that never was. During a recent vacation, I read a German language book titled, Die Irrelite der Romischen Reichs, or in English, The Unreality of the Roman Empire. As the book has not been translated into English, I'll provide a summary. Did the Romans build roads while invading enemy territory? The author, Gernigius, first looks into the historical fact of Roman soldiers crossing the Alps, the mountains leading from Italy across Austria and Switzerland, to conquer France and Germany against enemy armies of barbarian hordes. At the same time, they are carrying supplies, and also building roads and cities in conquered land, within a fairly short time. He asks how, while advancing into enemy territory across roadless mountains, they had the manpower and ability to build all these roads, fortresses, and walls, and also ward off the native barbarians in Germany and France, while additionally farming for food and carrying all their supplies. According to his calculations, they didn't have enough soldiers to accomplish such a feat. If indeed the Romans built the roads in the countries they were conquering, then why didn't they build them wide enough to have three soldiers march beside each other? The roads are so narrow that a procession of Romans must have gone for dozens of miles, making them vulnerable to attacks. This, and many other questions, remain unanswered, according to Gius. The idea that one city in Italy, Rome, and its approximately 30,000 able-bodied men, subtracting old men and boys, created an army that conquered the entirety of Europe, seems questionable. According to Gius, passing the Alps was also extremely difficult if roads did not yet exist prior to the Romans. He believes, the Romans did not build the roads, they were already there, and possibly built by the Celts. It is known that the Celts, who were said to have lived in Europe long before Rome, had advanced wagons and chariots. Their wagons required good roads to already have existed. If you don't have good roads, you don't build chariots. So, the idea that proper roads didn't exist before Roman times, is debunked by the fact that good wagons existed before Roman times, not only by the Celts, but also the Greeks, Egyptians and Sumerians. This wagon dated back to 600 BC, Stratwig, Austria. How would a chariot like this, navigate through the rocky alpine terrain of Austria without roads? The author says, that the Celts were not the barbarians as shown in history class. He asks, who would start building streets during an all-out war? No war of recent memory, had the warring parties, build continent-spanning roads during combat, even with modern technology. The streets must have been built in peaceful times, for peaceful purposes, before the Romans arrived. The author claims, there is no evidence, or documentation, on who built the roads. Certain roads that are dug up out of the mud, are labeled Roman roads, without documentation. Because all we know is Roman Empire, we label anything we dig up as Roman. There is only one document, called Tabula Putangeriana, that is taken as evidence of Roman road building. But the document is from the 12th century, long after the Roman Empire had passed away, if it ever existed. The document refers to a time a thousand years prior, but any documents it is based on, are missing. That's a common problem when trying to prove the Roman Empire existed. The documents proving it, are from a time long after the supposed empire had disappeared. Why were the Romans mostly French, German and Celtic? As other authors before him, such as Russian scholar Anatoly Fomenko, Gius asks, why the majority of Roman soldiers, ethnically consisted of Celts, Germans, and Frenchmen, Gauls, the countries they were supposedly invading. And why do many of the Caesars, or rulers, emperors, come from places in France, Britain, and Germany? 
Aren't these the countries the Romans were invading? Shouldn't the Roman army and ruling class have consisted mostly of ethnic Italians, Spaniards, or Southern Europeans? And if the Romans recruited their soldiers locally, surely the commanders must have at least originated from Italy or Rome. In his book, Gius provides long lists of Roman rulers that are Celts, Gauls and Germans. He posits that there is no discernible difference in the knighthood of the ancient Celts, to the knights' outfits and tools of the Middle Ages, to the behavior and outfit of Roman soldiers. They might as well be the same. In digging up helmets and swords, an archaeologist would be hard-pressed to identify his discovery as belonging to a medieval knight, a Celtic warrior, or a Roman soldier. It used to be assumed that any Celtic artifact dug up was part of loot stolen by the barbarians. Meanwhile, it's accepted that the Celts themselves were capable of making pottery, weapons, sophisticated wagons and much more. The difference between a Roman and a Celtic helmet perhaps does not denote a difference of culture, but simply a different fashion from a different time. The rulers of the Roman Empire were called Caesar, which is in fact a German word. C was pronounced K. It's the exact same sound as the German word Kaiser, which means ruler. Jernigia says that the Roman Empire is really an Iberian Celtic Germanic Empire. Similar to Anatoly Fomenko, he says that there were actually two Romes. Around the year 1000, there was a cataclysm or flood that destroyed the civilization of Europe or the Mediterranean. Some of it was rebuilt from the ruins and memory of what it used to be. The Romans post flood were the Celtic Germanic French Iberian people. The Romans pre flood were Greek. This is why so many of the dugout structures labeled Roman could just as well have been labeled Greek, while the more medieval-looking structures, such as castles and fortresses, were not submerged. The word Celts comes from the Greek word Keltoi. It means the brave and the exalted. An alternative Greek meaning is the ones who arrived, which would make them the immigrants. In 600 BC, the area of Italy was apparently populated by Greeks and Etruscans. Roman architecture is simply a mere continuation of Greek architecture with Etruscan influences. It is even possible that the pre-flood Greeks are the same as the post-flood Celts. In fact, 400 BC Italy was called Gallia. The Gallia people were the Gauls, or Celts, that populated England, Belgium, Netherlands and France at the time. Interestingly, the ancient Greeks called their army Italia. At one point, the entire Greek Empire, not just the region known as Italy today, was called Italia. The Greek letters developed from runes. Runes were the magical symbols of Northern Europe. The author has collected evidence from several sources and languages that the word Rome refers to troops, soldiers and army, not to a people or nation. He says that Roman is a profession within Celtic society, not an empire. Thus, a Roman could work as border patrol, a customs official, police, or military. Later on, Roman was the word for military fortresses and bases across Europe. This video is just an introduction to something I find really fascinating. If you find it interesting, I'll continue in part 2.